pal of mine and uh he's, he's kind of a renaissance guy he's sort of the anti-paul he, you know educator author theologian uh, psychologist uh, i would encourage you howard if you ever have a chance tom Pereira gave us a uh it was one of the more frightening presentations, a look <laughs> in the mind of an antique radio collector. If, if, <laughs> you can save that for Halloween next year because uh, we're still shaking a little bit over that one. So uh, I, I remember once being in a bookstore and I was looking to see what were some of the latest uh, books in psychology. And I saw one, there was one on, basically it was on the pathology of collectors. And it was about 25 bucks. And I looked at it and I thought about it. And I thought, yeah, I'd rather spend it on an old radio. Yeah. <laughs> it's a well pretty done. good book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is, is, it, is it collectors or hoarders, I guess, is, is the question. So, And it is flannel shirt night because uh, it's chilly up here tonight. So thanks so much for joining us, Howard. Howard has a pretty intense collection. And he is in the process from what uh, our pregame conversation was in trying to thin it down a little bit he's down from around 700 sets where are you now in, in the neighborhood of about 200 yeah i think i'm actually uh, uh more like 150 now oh good good for you and uh yeah. you got a great website with an awful a lot of neat stuff just the advertising section alone um could occupy <laughs> me for hours uh some of the some of the really cool pieces and uh as i think we all know there are people who would pay more for a neon radio sign uh in some cases than they would pay for uh, you know a highly sought after antique radio because who who cares about the radio i've got a sign you know which is one of those sort of mysteries but i guess that's probably more of an antique or collector thing but uh anyway so howard's going to take us through some of his favorite sets he maintains an online museum with a lot of neat stuff out of his collection all very well categorized from very early equipment up through some of the things we may be more familiar with from the 30s and 40s as well. So, John, I believe you have, um, are you going to share uh, Howard's site with us here on screen so we can go through some of his favorite sets? Yeah, that's what I'll do to ease, ease things for, uh, for Howard. I will share my screen and uh, Howard will be, can narrate. You can be the narrator. You can be so uh, yeah. Marlon Perkins. John can be the guy who ropes the, the big one. <laughs> right, right. That, that's Jim Fowler, you know, has to wrestle the alligator. And, you know, <laughs> yes. I'll stay home. safely in my Jeep and watch. <laughs> that's right. Uh -huh, sucker. Another um, ad for, it's a good thing he has a mutual Omaha policy, right? Exactly. All right. So let me do that. Um, but uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Howard, for joining us. And also just a quick uh, readings to a uh, new member, uh, Lloyd Spivey. I see you're on. Yes. And nice to see you, Lloyd. So the list I, is 1966. Uh, the, sorry? I say it's listed as 1966. Yeah, I see that. Don't, have, don't know. That's my computer name. Apparently the camera picked it up. Let's see now. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, sir. Excellent. So I'm going to um, now I'm going to have to I'm going to pop in and out of my email, which has the um, your your suggestion what you want to go to. I'm going to go to the first one that, was, that happens to be on the list here, if you don't mind. So what we have here, so what we have here, <laughs> one kilowatt radio transmitter. All right, Howard, take it away. What where'd you find okay. this? <laughs> well, I found it in many different places. It was uh, everything that's on that marble on the back there was there originally. Everything else, you know, one piece here, two pieces there. Um, it, the, the, it's from about 1913, 1914. Um, it, it, it works. I can, uh, if someone's visiting and, uh, and comes over, I usually have them stand near the rotary spark gap up in the top <coughs> and I fire it up and they jump out of their skin. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I, I, over two, three, four years, I accumulated on the right side underneath it, you'll see the, the transformer and the capacitor are, are both there. Um, what I did then is I had a man in South Texas hand scrape a, uh, a, uh, 
a bench to put it all together in. What I, I spent time looking at different uh, pre-broadcast type of setups. And, uh, and out of that, we, we kind of put this together. Uh, and it's, it's lovely. I, I also have a, a receiver that goes with it, which again was in it, just three different parts uh, to make it uh, work. Um, but yeah, that's um, 1914. I have the, in the drawer underneath, I have the catalog for it. You can find most of the parts there in that catalog. You know, um, I don't know if I've ever seen uh you know, a device like that with a stone, uh, you know, backing. Uh, was was that a common thing to your knowledge? Or it's, you know, that's, that's I, pretty I don't, that looks really sharp. I don't see that, but I, I would have to assume that that it was used in a, in a very fancy upscale place to put all that equipment on it there. Uh, you know, given given that type of equipment in that area, you're, you're probably 100% correct there. Right. Uh, I think a, a number of the pieces came from back east, um, and, and some of them came right from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Many of the quack medical devices uh, were mounted on marble like that to impress the patients with how well they're being <laughs> cured. <laughs> I'm hey, sure uh, you know, if I could add uh, electrical switch gear from that period. Uh, would be on slate. It wouldn't be as fancy as this, obviously, but it will always be on slate. In, in my past work, uh, uh, working life, uh, I dismantled many old uh, slate boards that were uh, a, a good inch thick, and uh, believe me, they were heavy. Hey, uh, hey folks, if you, just, um, if you don't mind, just uh, make sure you uh, uh, mute yourself unless you uh, want to talk because we're getting just a little bit of background noise. Thanks. Um, I have a quick question, if I can. Okay, George. Oh. It mentions it's a one kilowatt. How, how do you measure a one kilowatt on a spark gap? Uh, you look in the catalog yeah. and uh, buy the one kilowatt condenser and uh, transformer, and that's how you measure it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, I, yeah, I have that's... a question. I have a question as well, if I could. Uh, I just finished a four kilowatt uh, Tesla coil. And one of the things I have is a 1918 Murdoch rotary spark gap running at 3,600 RPM. Whoa, does that thing make a racket? So uh, I can imagine that your rotary spark gap is somewhat similar to that. That's it, thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, if I have downstairs in our kitchen, a malted milk uh, machine maker yeah. from the same period. And it uses the same uh, motor that's on the back of that rotary spark, that rotary spark gap up in the upper uh, right corner. And you can actually adjust the speed to kind of adjust the tone uh, uh, on the left side back of there. There's actually a speed adjustment on it. Mm. Very cool, very sharp, nice piece. And it shows so awesome. well on that, on that beautiful table. But yeah, my yeah. wife, it, it, it's in our bedroom, and my wife would like it gone. <laughs> <laughs> is that your you alarm clock? That's a test of a marriage, is that you, you can have a full kilowatt uh, transmitter uh, in the bedroom, but uh, we do. I don't want to hear any, I don't want to hear anything else about my 62 Chrysler dashboard. <laughs> you want from me, Noah, not from me. Yes, uh, just so Howard's in the loop. So uh, Mr. Nowasaki took us on a tour of, of some of the things in his bedroom, and he has a uh, basically part of a car. So you, you tell wow. her she's doing pretty good down there, Howard, and uh, not to not to complain so much about it. <laughs> Could always be worse. Well, <laughs> let's be, go, let's go to the chambers, uh, the FB chambers uh, radio next. Now, which okay, tab would that be good. in? Um, uh, that would be under wireless. Okay, All of it. these will be in wireless until we get to the Marconi. So go to wireless. Yep. Let's go to top. The... the top. Oh, the top. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're in wireless already. Sorry. Yeah. No, never. Yeah. 
And you, sorry, it's, it looks like it's alphabetical order. You said, what was it again? Yeah, right. It FB is Chambers. FB Chambers. Oh, FB. F okay. FB. There we go. Yeah. That's one below. Oh, yeah, that's it right there. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's um, it's right next to me here. Um, I know of one other one to exist of this. Uh, the, the, the wood in it is just, you know, spectacular. And what kind of wood is that? Uh, Beautiful. Beats me. Looks like curly maple. Ah, that's absolutely beautiful. But it, I love the pattern on it. <clears throat> and you, you can see the uh, on the front right, there is a locking door there that you can keep your spare uh, spherical audion in or anything else that you might need. Uh, you could buy this set either as a crystal with a crystal detector in or uh, with the spherical audion. Um, was uh, to to allow uh, watchmakers and time uh, makers to uh, check uh, the time exactly coming from Washington, D.C. So they would tune in at noon and at 10 o'clock at night, and uh, you could hear uh, the exact time, and then they could set their watch and their clocks to that. And that's how they build it. Um, Epi Chambers was probably the first uh, uh, maker of radios in Philadelphia. And I mean, obviously Atwater Kent was there, but Epi Chambers was, was probably the first one uh, there. And this is a very early piece. I have also uh, a long wave uh, loose coupler. This one right here is a, uh, a broadcast band. Uh, loose coupler on it, um, and uh, it you know I've I've never fired it up to see because I just didn't want to use up a uh, spherical audio, but I assume it would work. Do, it's all do, there and wired properly. Did you refinish it, Howard? Pardon me. Did you refinish it, or is that the original finish? That's, uh, that's the original finish. Wow, unbelievable. Howard, uh, it's, it's an absolutely gorgeous radio, holy smokes. But uh, my question to you is this, uh, I had a chance to buy a spherical audio on for $350 some three or four years ago. Did I miss out in a bargain? Depends if it was real or not and if it had a good filament or not. Uh, now, are, do your audions have any filament, uh, any emissions? I never try them. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to be safe. I only check there. the filament. I won't fire it up. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. I get that. Uh, just an amazing radio. Thank you. Check out uh, the no, recording. Would... Check out the recording on the talk on Phil Weingarten that I gave. He made a lot of fake spherical audions. And right. You don't want to exactly. get caught by one of those. It's very no, hard would... not to get caught by them. I have a couple that are not correct as well as I have maybe half a dozen good ones. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're dear. Now, how and then there was a guy even... in South Texas for a while who was making, they didn't look exactly like these, but he was making audions and selling them on eBay. Yeah. Wow, I bet he got a lot of money for him. I think he was getting like 350 bucks. I was just curious, uh, did that even need much of a cleanup when, when you found that set, or was, or was that pretty much the, the condition uh, the that you found top, it? The top lid needed help. A little work. And everything else uh, needed nothing. That's beautifully preserved. How did you Amazing. find it? Howard? Well, I, I was in another uh, collector's uh, place uh, taking pictures of a detector of a Marconi piece. And uh, I told him I really fell madly in love with this piece. And I said, if you ever sell it, you know, let me know. And he let me know. And it was very Beauty. pricey, but 
Yeah. I got it. Nice that it worked out. Got it. Well, hey, Howard. Yes. You could, you could disconnect the tube and run a germanium diode across there just to check the receiver out. Uh, I sure could. Thank you, Bill. Okay, yeah, so what's fact, I, I always keep uh, a diode on a uh, on alligator clips uh, when I'm uh, uh, checking out a crystal set. I clip that across the uh, the crystal detector and get it tuned up, and then I then try to get the the cat's whisker to function. Nice. That is that is special. That's great. <clears throat> so uh, that is uh, the uh, the FB chambers. Uh, let's go to the Fleming valve and radiosonde detector next. Will I be and they still in the wireless uh, tab? Yep, everything will be in the wireless till the last item. I'll I'll alert you. There we go. Now I I have over the years bought two, possibly three things, a, a radios on eBay. I, I, I just have never done the scrolling in there. I buy parts, but I just put the part I want and then it alerts me when one comes up. But uh, someone said, Howard, there's a strange piece on eBay you might be interested in. So I looked at it and um, it didn't, and I recognize the Fleming uh, valve uh, base, and uh, because I've I've been in the uh, annex of the of the science museum in England, I've lived in England on a couple of occasions, and uh, got to hold a number of the very first Fleming valves, and wow. so I knew I knew what the uh, the uh, socket looked like. And I also knew what a radiosan holder looked like. And this thing had between <clears throat> an eighth and three sixteenth of an inch of a greasy, dirty covering over the whole thing. And so it didn't look like much. And I think I paid six, $700 for it uh, on eBay, but I knew uh, what, you know, it was a homebrew set, but I knew the uh, Fleming valve, and I happened to have at that time a Fleming valve I could put in it. I didn't have the Radiosan uh, electrolytic detector. To the left of the of the um, the Fleming valve is the Radiosan detector. It's an electrolytic detector, and. Uh, uh, but I told Bob Dobish that I was looking because he's out scrounging all the time. And wouldn't you know, about four or five years later, he came up with one. It was pricey, but then it completed the set. And if you, I have, uh, as you probably do, the uh, um, a catalog with all of these early parts in it. And you can just go down the catalog and you will just find one right after another. It's electrical impart importing uh, uh, parts is the whole thing is made with, with the exception of the, uh, the Fleming valve and the diode. And, and the Fleming valve, which uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of, is a diode so it can detect, uh, but it can't amplify. So anyway, Another that's- nice looking piece. Yeah, uh, it, yeah, I really, you know, all, all the pieces here I'm showing today are, are some of my, <coughs> my absolute favorites. Well, you know, Howard, you mentioned uh, Bob Dobush, and we're just uh, for anybody who's not familiar with him. So Bob maintains a uh, website and a business, uh, Find a Tube. And uh, even for those folks who may be looking for something that's more common, or even occasionally the harder to find, you know, he, his prices are quite good considering what you can run across. You know, some people are really out to, you know, clean up on certain things, but uh, his service is nice. You know, his wife will answer the phone and he gets your orders right out. So he's, he's located, I believe in Ohio and uh, 
I believe he used to be uh, associated with uh, the Estes folks, and he would handle the tube end of a lot of the estates and the like. That um, and, and he got come. this radius on detector in with a bunch of tubes. Yeah, you know, just the never dollars. know what's in that box, right? <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to the um, the IP seventy six. All right. IP76. There we take the this one right here, I think, right? Is yep. IP203? Oh, that's not it. Oh, uh, that's under under wireless. The I yes. So what did I Let's see? Did this keep going down? Sure. Oh, maybe it's maybe it's sitting below. Mark, you have this nicely alphabetized, makes it so much easier. That Lowenstein tuner, yikes. Don't you have some really yeah, you know, fantastic looking things here. Uh, whoa, you, you, uh, you see, there it is. There That's we go. It. Which one? It's just uh, the second from the bottom. Oh, just one here. From the bottom. Third from the bottom. Oh, there we go. I see the okay, IP50. Right there, second oh, one I'm sorry. Got it. There we go. 76. Sorry. Four you know, when I was looking four. wireless and didn't look far enough. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, from 1911. Wow. Yeah, you can scroll down and see some of the pictures of this before restoration. I think okay. I have some there. Here we go. How's that? Before yep. this set. Here we go. Yeah, wow. there's before. Some of the before. I'm just going to scroll downward here a little bit. Need a little love. Yeah, I've, I've, got, a, so. I've got a bowl. Needed a whole lot right of love. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's actually, it's okay. not really an IP76, it's a 1P76, but everyone refers to it as the IP76. It, it um, in the early teens, uh, actually going back to even about 1911, uh, this was the Navy's primary receiver. And you have at the upper level where that lid is popped up, you have two different crystal detectors there. Uh, and um, and then you have a loose coupler, which by the way, it's gear driven, but it's actually remarkably good the way it functions. The upper left corner is where you can uh, listen to long wave or you can listen to, uh, to the broadcast band. Um, is there a loading coil in there? Uh, yes. And um, uh, this, uh, that's right, I can't point. <laughs> oh, sorry, I can try. That's all right. No, no. Um, it's, um, it's just a, a very basic crystal set from about 1911. And it was used even sometimes as backup into the late teens um, on naval ships. And certainly if they were losing a lot of electricity, electric power, they could get this on. And it came, as you saw, in many, many pieces. And I, I had to scrounge parts for it. Um, I didn't have the crystal detectors for it, um, but they are the same ones on a triple detector, which you originally, John, that you originally clicked on. Ah. And uh, so that's just the two from the uh, triple detector. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good set. But surprisingly, it's not that common in collections. I don't see them very often. I'm not sure why that is. It took me a month or so just researching it to find out what went where. And what, in the process of researching the 1P76, 
I discovered that there were actually six different variations of it that were made, several which uh, don't seem to be in anyone's collection, but I could find it in old uh, photographs or old uh, 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 pictures. So anyway, that's, that's one of my favorite uh, radios that I have, partially no, because just... it took so much time to uh, restore it. Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, imagine in my head uh, the type of naval vessel you know, from that time frame that you would find one of those in, which is uh, just challenging yeah. my mind right now. You know, sort of the, the sort of the pre. Uh, I mean, I don't know. That's 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 the dreadnought era almost, right? So uh, the the monument and the Merrimack. Yeah, almost. <laughs> the the interesting thing is either that ship has long been scrapped or is sitting at the bottom of the ocean, but the radio is not. Yeah, you know, in the in the navy, you know, to your point, Howard, you 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 might think that you would see more of them, but I don't know. It's a long time ago, and things. things and, don't and always of course, they're not using cat's whiskers. Those both of those are, are you know, you you bury a needle in your um, in your uh, crystal, and uh, there are two different types of crystals used, and it would hold uh, quite well. But if at the last minute somehow it jostled, you just switched over to the other detector. Interesting. Nice piece. Yeah, that is. I, piece that I've never seen. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's a favorite of mine, like I said. Okay, oh, let's uh, go keep going down uh, on the page that you're on. Yeah. And uh, why don't you click the one second the bottom because I thought Tom might. It, just take a look at that. Yeah, sure. this, this is a World War I uh, uh, set, telegraph set from England, and, uh, that is which cute. I kind of like. Fabulous condition. Yeah, it is. It is. I have upstairs in the attic a green military box that the whole thing slides into and that's why it's in cool. good shape plus i doubt it was used much at all so you have the original holder then that's really interesting oh you have some pictures here if i might yeah so this is yeah, there it's in the box so this is where it would have been used yes uh, that's where they're learning code ah and then and you can the see box. the next position down is, yeah, you can see the box that uh, it fits in. That's, that's beautiful. And there's, yeah, there is the box. Okay. Not bad. Let's, and even the beautiful brass plate. Uh, we'll, we, we'll go back out sure. on wireless. And I think the bottom one on that page is that one right there. Telefunken, very good. The early nice days. Scroll down and, and take a look at some of the pictures. 1960. Let's just stop right there. That is the uh, uh, transmitter and receiver in there. Uh, the receiver is missing, but the transmitter is in there. Um, we'll keep scrolling down. Sure. There's what the entire outfit would look like if you had everything in it. To the left is the, is the transmitter receiver. Uh, and, you know, that's made by uh, Fleeg. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Telefunken in the center, and that's a three tube resistance coupled amplifier. And uh, uh, I have the uh, key for, for this setup here. And the story behind this is that um, a family in, in uh, Belgium contacted me well, 15 years ago and said that they were dealing with the estate of 
uh, their father and they found this and uh, wanted to know if I'd be interested in purchasing it. And I said, yes, it was World War I piece. It looked really interesting. And I said, uh, I wanted to know the story behind it. And he said, well, he, he re he'd research, he said, he didn't even know that his dad had it until he's died in there up in the, in the attic of his house and found the set there. And uh, so he uh, checked around and see if he get information. And, and the story that he believes is correct. Well, I'll tell you the one he's not certain is correct, which was that some um, soldiers that knew the war was over with and were on their way back to Germany and were selling whatever they could get to people to get enough money to have some food so they could eat and get back to Germany. The story that he believes is correct is that uh, this was a, a, in a uh, reconnaissance aircraft. Mm. They even use these some in uh, in blimps, right? And it wasn't used in our aircraft for um, shooting, <clears throat> but for just finding out what's going on. Uh, and they're flying over Belgium, and it was shot down and crashed in a field. Uh -huh. And my theory is that uh, whoever liberated this from the plane. Um, took the receiver out, which they weren't supposed to use or have, but, uh, but you know, extracted that and used that during the war, during the end of the war, and the rest they just tossed away because they had no use for it. One of the great puzzles is uh, why the telegraph key has that high knob on it. And there are a number of theories. The one I like most is that in World War I, the pilots wore thick gloves and it helped them to keep their hand on the key when they were sending a uh, telegraph. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Uh, of course, there are some that would be spark keys. They might be insulating themselves too. Hmm. Yep, it's a possibility. I've always wondered also how they could uh, use spark uh, so close to a hydrogen airbag or hydrogen filled <laughs> bag in their uh, in their That's crazy. <laughs> Every so often it didn't work out. <laughs> so my, you know, uh, what I think happened is it, it crashed and, uh, you know, some local now this is in belgium it uh they got it and confiscated it and quickly stowed it away probably pulling out the receiver and uh and then i ended up with it and i i kind of get a kick out of it you know it's, it's interesting when the radio finds you you know i mean you can look yeah. for all this stuff you know that you you on your want list and then somebody gets in touch with you and here you go you know <laughs> Especially well, they, something as rare as this. I mean, there's so yeah. many pieces here in your wireless tab. Well, you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm a computer idiot and, um, and have a website, uh, mainly because about uh, the year 2000, um, I had a good friend where I taught at TCU and, and we, we would, uh, you know, have coffee together and chat. And he, like me, just like to scrounge for old stuff of all sorts. And he's, he, you know, he saw, he'd seen the, the collection stuff I had. And he said, you know, Howard, you ought to have a website. And I said, yeah, you know, me, a computer idiot. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't handle it. And that was on a Friday. I came to work Monday. And over the weekend, he built me the website. <laughs> and then I felt nice. obligated to use it because I couldn't <laughs> say no then because it was built. Uh, and so I got it. Now, my website now is basically fixed. He, um, he's out of the business of doing that. Uh, 
he, I pay him once a year the money needed for the host and uh, I can't make changes in there. I'd like to make some changes. I'd like to make some additions. Um, I like uh, both broadcast and shortwave DXing and I have some really nice uh, receivers uh, that I like to use that I'd like to put pictures on my website, but I can't because the, the website's basically frozen where it is right now. But I'll have to find anyway, you a new webmaster. Yeah. You can, you yeah, can set I up a separate it. website. <laughs> I've thought about, but I'm, I'm diminishing the collection. So I I'm hear you. pleased the way it is right now. Well, well it's, it's, great, it's a great reference uh, to have, you know, at, at, at our disposal. It's very well done. Yeah, if you typed in antique radio, I would be in probably the 35th page because I don't spend any money on it and it doesn't make any changes. So your your you, Google throws you farther and farther and farther back. Uh, well, it serves as a good function though for somebody looking to identify something or looking for a yep. lead or to get some information. You know, the, the information is still all very valid, so. Absolutely. Yeah, it was when I first... When I first had the website, though, there was just a few of them. And then, I mean, I would spend up to two hours a day answering emails from all over the world. And, I, and wow. typically, I would get uh, uh, emails from over 80 countries uh, every uh, week, excuse me, every month. Uh, so it was, that was a wonderful time that I was you know, busy teaching and all that. So it was time consuming and I would love to uh, got that, get that impact now. And it was, you know, and then eBayers found the website and then they would say, so uh, can, what can you tell me about this and how much do you think it's worth? And you, you knew that they wanted me to write their, their email, eBay ad for yes. them. Yes, I would still and, appraisal services, yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, of course, they so were going I, to give you the. I stopped commission. doing that. Yeah, I don't blame you. The other interesting thing with websites is that uh, people will sometimes steal the pictures from the website and put that set on eBay. Several of my uh, enigmas have been on eBay uh, without my knowledge. Oh, that's interesting. I've had a uh, an apartment uh, of ours put on, but uh, never that. Uh, but yes. Uh, well, let's go to the next uh, piece. Okay. Now, will that still be in the wireless, um, Howard? Yeah, that'll. Uh, the, the next one will be in Marconi Wireless. So, oh, okay. go all the way up to the top on sure. the left. Let's see here. Keep going. I guess keep going up. Sorry, I, yeah. I'm looking at this in alphabetical order, so I, I'm probably not. No, uh, left, what we're going to do is go. We're going to go to left. a new, uh, a new one. So just keep going to the very top. Oh, okay. All the way to the top. Now you can see over there it says. Uh, oh, I'm number, sorry. The, the Marconi left, tab. There the we left, go. Left is Marconi Wireless. Got it. Yeah, I'm on the tab. I sorry, I thought it was in, still in the wireless. Um, nope, sorry, that's quite all right. Uh, and then let's go down to uh, the uh, Marconi Wireless 16 crystal receiver. Wireless, here we go. Yep. All right, and let's scroll down and just look at some of the pictures. All right. Oh, okay. Oh, this looks a bit rough. It's, you can stop there. Um, uh, this was in this, the Marconi 16 crystal set came out in 1914. And in about 1918, uh, the ship it was on was sunk. And in 1999, it was raised or 80 years later. Wow. And this is a picture of it after all the mud and the muck had been cleaned off of it before I started really doing the 
the restoring of it. Mm. And you can see below, that's the original uh, case for it. Uh, the first picture you saw, I had an, uh, I have a reproduction case now holding it because that, that wood case is very brittle and fragile. It keeps strolling down and you see a few more pictures of the condition wow. of it. That ship was raised. Now, where, where was the ship found? You know, uh, it, it was found, it, it was raised uh, outside of London. Interesting. Did you do the restoration, Howard? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, what, what it was is I was visiting another radio collector and uh, to take pictures of a detector that he had that I needed uh, for a restoration project I was on. And I always would say, and do you have any other Marconi pieces you for sale? And he paused for a second. He said, well, I have one in the basement. And then he told me he had it for three years and he was, cons and he just run out of steam on it. But the pictures you see was after he cleared out the mud and muck, uh, you know, even thicker on it. Wow. And, but he, he didn't have any more steam and he knew it was going to just disintegrate because it sat in, in uh, salt water for so many years. So uh, we agreed on some uh, money. It was expensive for a basket case like this, but it was a Marconi. And uh, uh, hauled that back uh, to Fort Worth and started restoring on it. An advantage was I had, had just had one knee surgery. And so I sat in a recliner with a platform across me and just slowly would clean uh, this thing. Um, if I knew it took this much work, I would have never taken on this project. But uh, I'm sure there's other people who said the same. <laughs> but it was the most satisfying one that I ever worked on because I had to bring it back so far. That, that one pier, that IP76 was the second biggest restoration project I had. Oh, but I just, one, one of the things that was interesting uh, in it is that the hard rubber, which is you know like Bakelite, the hard rubber panel was like new. It was only four years old. And so it was just beautiful uh, after it got the mud off. The, the variable condenser with a round knob on it um, was mush inside. Basically any iron or steel in it uh, was, was history. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, there's not much in it. Uh, most of it was in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the condenser. Uh, the Billy condenser, which is that on the left, uh, the picture we're looking at, the left uh, item, move your uh, cursor. Yeah, that right there. That's the Billy condenser. That's also condenser. Why they made that and then had a rotary one, I have no idea. I've always been curious about that. I'm sure someone somewhere has an idea about why. That took me a month to break that one loose. Wow. Uh, and it just, I would just gently nudge it a little bit after cleaning it totally up. Um, and let's go back to the top picture again now. Yeah, that's not, you could, that, yeah. Whoa. The, uh, what I did was the guy who I bought the Marconi from here had, had secured another rotary um, uh, variable condenser. And, um, but it had, it had a bad knob. What, what I did is I, I wanted 
you can't see closely, but you, you know, if you were in my house, you would be able to see all of the uh, brass on this uh, set is etched because what salt water does is it takes the tin out of the brass and tends to leave more of a copper. And uh, so that's, it's a pockmark outer cut case. So I just dropped in uh, the other uh, Marconi condenser inside of it and put this knob back on the, uh, that and uh, it, it works just fine. Wow. I, ha I had to, on the front uh, left are two resistors, variable resistors. And I had to raw wire that, put new wire on that. Um, and then a few uh, of the uh, screws around the edge, it, they would snap. You could just bend them in your fingers. They would snap like a, like a hard cookie. Yeah. Uh, they, they no longer uh, had any strength at all. Yeah, they lost so their integrity. So I replaced those and, and a couple small pieces on the crystal detectors, which are on the very back. It's a double crystal detector uh, that you could use either individually or they said you could use it uh, together. Um, wow. You know, considering so, how long, you know, the, the, if that was anywhere near, you know, I've never been to London, but you know, the Harbor proper, I can just, you know, I know how dirty Boston Harbor was down in the muck from all the different, you know, shipping chemicals, materials, tars, oils, sludge. Can you imagine how much stuff, you know, and what stuff, you know, that was sitting in for years? It, yeah, what, what got me was how beautiful the hard rubber is because I yeah, like, you know, and that was mint. Unbelievable. But, uh, and, and what was interesting, the coils, the, the framework for the coils, the wood, inside there is still original. Again, it's hmm. very brittle. I, I glued a couple pieces together with it. And what's interesting is that's the original uh, wire on the coils. And I put, a, I put a piece of the wire under a microscope and you can still see the uh, silk covering of the wire. Huh. I also, when I, when I, Resoldered things back inside again. I was able to use the original uh, hookup wire that was used uh, from piece to piece in there. So uh, it's quite original right now, um, and uh, is one of my absolute favorites in the collection. That is very cool. Wow, Amazing. that's interesting. Is they raised the ship? Was there something unusual about it that that caused them to raise the ship? I, I, you know, I've, I've, you know, I tried to go backwards to find out just what what ship it was and all that. You know, the collector that I got this from was cagey about it, but he did say he got it. Uh, uh, what happened? There was an antique uh, dealer over in in England who got the pieces um, from some guys that were salvaging and came across it. Um, so I don't know what ship it was on. They were able, the, the divers were able to say that it was about 1918 uh, when it was shot down. Very interesting wow. provenance. So, very well, cool. Well, Mike Fair also um, restored a Marconi set that had been underwater. And I wonder, have you any made any contact with him or seen his work? Yes, I've, I've been to his, that, uh, that uh, FB, uh, that timepiece, the FB chambers I got from Mike. So, yeah, I have had contact with him. 
the restoration is this impressive, Howard, absolutely impressive. Thank you. Thank you. It took a phenomenal amount. Each, each coil inside took 20 to 30 hours. I tried, you know, I tried to get information on what chemical should I use to get rid of the, the salt on it. And basically, uh, I was urged to not use any chemicals at all, but just to use warm water. Not even, if you use any soap, use just a little bit of soap, but basically just warm water and just keep soaking it and then taking it out. And I would put it on the shelf and then I'd uh, rinse and gently rub because I didn't want to rub that, uh, the covering of the wire off or mess that up. And so I just kept doing it slowly over the years, I uh, mean, over the months until I was satisfied that <coughs> it wasn't changing anymore. Um, iron and steel require electrolysis. Did you uh, attempt to stabilize any of the small amount of uh, iron or steel in there? There isn't any left in there. Right. It's all gone. The, the, it was the inside of the, uh, the rotary uh, condenser and uh, the resistance wire on the two... Uh, uh, con uh, variable resistors on the front corner. That was it. Everything else was basically brass. Too bad you couldn't show that to the divers who pulled it out of the ship. Yeah, yeah I would. I, I would love to <laughs> chat with them. I know. It feels like you should be on some sort of like a Nova, Howard. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is our version, Nevik Nova. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'll, I'll, we'll start soliciting. Uh, Donations from our viewing audience. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we'll be out of business in no time. Well, those are the, the six cents I wanted to show you. I Thank you so much. Y'all listening. Oh, that's, thank you for showing nice. us things that are older than we are. You know, that's, that's always nice. <laughs> Even older than me. <laughs> now, Howard, would you indulge us if I asked John to go take a look at uh, in your advertising section here? Sure. Yeah. Uh, that RCA uh, tube that you told me you have for nightlight, <laughs> I want one for my room. I'm like the little baby in Tom Pereira's. <laughs> that's hard. That's hard not to I want. want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. Uh, Paul, uh, yes. Someone told me it's on eBay right now for seven hundred fifty bucks. Uh, well, I don't need a nightlight that bad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'll stick no, with the C7 nice. bulb. <laughs> that is nice. Uh, you gotta admit. Oh yeah, I love it. Um, that was a visually a, a real, socket. real eye catcher, you know, at the store level, huh? Oh, there's some nice one. I mean, I, I you know, I'm the, just neon, the RCA now. neon clock there. Yeah. Now that's a, that's a, a really unusual one. Uh, works well. Uh, it, it was sent to me from, I believe from Canada and all the tubes were broken, but I had the pieces and there was a guy at the University of in Arlington, Texas, right next to us, who taught uh, glass blowing and uh, taught neon uh, blowing. And he made new neon for me. And what was interesting is he took the old pieces and, and he, I don't know if, it, if what type of a light he shine, he was able to shine a light on it and tell me exactly what color it was, wow. and he had the vintage colors. Uh, he had vintage uh, glass uh, tubing that he bought a number of years ago that he used for this, and I love that piece. Wow, it's got to be it pays to have the right friends, huh? That's a, that's a great job. Exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, I would every once in a while go to at TCU. I'd go to the glass blowing uh, guy there because he'd build me. Uh, a piece that I would needed for restoring a crystal set. Uh, and uh, I would uh, go sometimes to the machine shop uh, at T to help me uh, uh, build a piece. Um, ultimately, I got my own lathe and so that I could make uh, binding posts and things like that because I, you know, like probably most of you, I have a stash of binding posts but none for these early wireless pieces. Sure. So I, 
would tend to have to make them myself. That's great. You know, sometimes when you approach somebody who's in that, you know, who has that skill, you know, who's in that particular, whether it's neon or glass or woodwork, and you approach them as a collector with something that's a unique challenge, you know, they, they rise to that. They, they like to help, you know, the fellow uh, aficionado, even though they may be in a different realm than the one that they live in. And, Especially uh, when you buy nice lunch when afterwards. Out. Yeah, you buy lunch, yes. Lunch at a Lone Star beer, right? We, we there can you are. On. Beautiful. Anybody have any questions for Howard uh, this evening? That, that anything they'd like to share or remark about what he's shown us or questions as to uh, his collection? Uh, yes. I'm going to throw things open a little bit. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. Am I on? Yes, oh, you are. You're going to do what? You are definitely on. <laughs> I'm just getting used to all this, gentlemen, uh, but I'm so glad I did. What a fun group. Uh, Howard, I've enjoyed your website for, for many, many years, and uh, I go back to that early book, uh, Vintage Radio. It was done in a two-color orange and cream cover, with, uh, and it was full of uh, pictures of Vintage Radio having some... Uh, early coffin sets as a kid i uh, sort of appreciated the older stuff although i certainly <laughs> can't right afford there. it so yeah yeah so I, I go to your site so i can sit there and dream and make pretend that maybe if uh i receive a uh, unexpected large amount of money i can approach you for a couple of those wonderful wonderful radios so uh that's it great website holy smoke what a collection uh, I, you do realize you. that most most of us consider that unobtainium, right? Well, I did too as a teacher, but uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, I found if you just scrounge a lot and you you read uh, that book and many others and look at pictures, you get you begin to get an idea of what something looks like. You know that that uh, Fleming valve set that I had, I think most people didn't know what, what it was, uh, but I, I recognized the, the, uh, what the base of the Fleming valve looked like. And so I was able to buy that. Well, I just think it's wonderful. All right, gentlemen, everybody, please stay safe and uh, have a good rest of your week. This is KC1AC, I'm signing up. Thank you, Mark. Uh, excuse me, Howard. Um, could I ask you your pedigree? Are you uh, uh, from the east, or are you always Texan, or what? I'm I'm a Minnesotan. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was born and raised in Minneapolis. We still have a summer cabin in northern Minnesota because I love to fish, uh, uh, and where our cabin is, they didn't get electricity until 1943. So the type of radios I'm interested in never show up there, uh, but uh, the fish do. So <laughs> I'm yeah, wondering I there, but I've been in Texas now for 41 years, lived a little bit in California and Arizona and uh, was in Philadelphia a couple of times, uh, lived in England a couple of, of times, um, did some teaching over there at the university. So, you know, been around. Um, I wonder if you ever uh, found your way into the uh, the storerooms or the attics of any of the buildings in the universities where you've been. I found that Columbia University up in the furthest attic had just piles of the earliest physics equipment and uh, early radio gear and uh, especially the, the big clock that's up uh, in many schools, attics uh, is a magnificent piece of antique machinery. Did you ever climb up into any of those spaces? Uh, Tom, yeah, I, I did. Unfortunately, I was told when I got to know some of the people in the physics as well as in engineering that they had, had, uh, they had moved facilities and they emptied out a massive storeroom of stuff. But I still did once get a box of, uh, of about 10 uh, 
number 20 tubes, uh, four pin tubes. And I, every once in a while they would come across some other piece and they would contact me uh, and, and I would get it. Good. Tom, I thought for sure you were gonna launch into uh, the old story about Professor Lang. So I'm glad you didn't do that. <laughs> Howard, it looks to me, you know, from your website with, you know, this would look like it would translate well to a book because you have a lot of great stories behind each of these pieces. Yeah, I've had people trying to get me to write a book on it or to start a museum. I've not been interested in either. Um, I wrote about a dozen books while I was in academia and I decided that's enough. So I'm not, I, you know, the only writing I do right now is in revisions of books that are already in print of mine. But no, I'm just enjoying uh, uh, working on the radios. Fabulous. You have to, your collection is superb. It's pieces I've never seen before until now. So Howard, when you mentioned your place up in uh, Minnesota there, I don't know, John, uh, where was that little log cabin radio on your website, Howard? Because that's really cool. And you had mentioned, if anybody oh, yeah. knows anything more about this, could they please tell us? Right. So, I mean, we have an august group here of, of, uh, of radio collectors. Let, let, let want to see if anybody has, yeah. uh, has uh, anything, any light to shed, shall we say. That was a cute little set. Do you, want yeah. me to, do you want me to quickly like share that? that? All, the, all the historically significant things he's showing. And of yeah, course, it would I be, like the, it would I be like the little glow the, in the dark cabin, you know. It would be under the radios uh, 1930, 1960. Yeah, I already found it. How about that, folks? Okay. Whoa, okay. Now, Beco I, Manufacturing, huh? Beco. Beco, Beco. Yeah, Beco. Now, I, I did scrounge out a picture at some time and the center, which is the speaker, I think had some type of grill work there. Uh -huh. but, but, you know, since I have a cabin in the woods in Minnesota, when I saw that I had to have it. Oh, that's awesome. That's actually awesome. Another one I've never seen before. And it's in Minnesota at the cabin. That's great. That is great. So when you mentioned that, you know, in at that particular deck of the woods up in Minnesota, you know, they weren't electrified until 1943. So you think about that as really sort of a DX's paradise prior to electrification. I mean, if you had a farm set, you have virtually, you know, no interference to deal with, albeit, you know, you'd have to watch your batteries depending on how far of, from civilization you were. But what a great spot, you know, not only to go fishing, but to, uh, Listen to the world. Do you, did the you one, ever do any? You ever do any DXing when you when you were up there? Uh, a little bit, um, uh, both listening and then I'm I'm KC5PC, so transmitting. Um, I have a little min, old mini quad up there. One negative up there is I'm on the iron range. Uh huh. And that affects. Uh, Certainly, it affects some listening up there, and maybe transmitting too. I'm not sure, um, but uh, yes, we're on the Iron Range, where you know, back from the early 20th century, so much of the iron steel came from came from that area. Good for three M. <laughs> Yeah, if we keep this up, you know, we could just walk through the rest of your collection there, Howard. Yeah, but I'm hungry. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. <laughs> I don't blame you. You know, it's a cute little set. Can't say that I've ever seen one of those, but uh, I mean, maybe that was something that was, uh, you know, specialty for a certain, certain chain of stores or something. Who knows? Outdoor yeah. stores, maybe. I don't know. What are you working on now, Howard? Um. Well, actually, right now, I am replacing the volume control and switch 
in a uh, Arvin Hoppy radial. Um, it's pretty, pretty advanced compared to uh, your other. <laughs> 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 this newfangled stuff. Well, you know, I I'm always looking for a new pro wireless project, and uh, I don't have anything right now to dig into deeply. I have a few things I could do some work on, but uh, you know, just looking for a, a basket case. <laughs> oh, we'll find you some. Yes. I think we have plenty around. <laughs> <laughs> if we if we pull off our next event in May, we'll we'll think of you. We'll, uh, we'll okay, thank you. <laughs> what we can find. Well, if anybody else has any questions, comments, reactions, otherwise, we'll let Howard uh, finish up with us and uh, grab some food because we appreciate you interrupting you sort of in your prime dinner hour out there in in Texas. So uh, again, yeah, thank you so much it. for uh, sitting in with us tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invite. That was absolutely outstanding. Um, if we can, if we can reel you back in again one day in the future, we'd love to have you back. Thank you. Thanks again, Howard. Okay, gentlemen. Thanks, have a great night. Yeah. Um, maybe just a quick uh, announcement here. Um, yes, sir. I'll send an email out, uh, but uh, but we'll be wanting to do uh, Zoom Fest is going to happen. Um, on the March 7th date that would have been our big show. So I'd hinted at it on some emails. So I'll be sending an email out probably this weekend is to sort of uh, uh, to uh, set, reset the rules, which are basically it's the same format, the same approach that were basically was taken um, back um, when Tom and, and Bruce organized it back in May. So it'll look familiar. What I've decided to do is, is just make it into one template. So that way it's sort of the way we'll always do it. And then we can always tweak it as we find better ways to do it. But um, um, there will be an article going out in the, in the next Raven anyway, but I just figured I'd since I have everybody here, if anyone wants to join, I, some people have already reached out and I will send out the list that I know up to this point. Um, some of you guys definitely have, but if you want to just reach out to me and what we'll do is get you on the list and we'll be doing your normal five minute slot, um, which we'll be able to rotate, we'll do a round robin so we'll go through the first round and then uh, we'll have additional slots if, um, if you know, time allows, but it'll be a, a nine to 12 uh, uh, um, event. Um, and I'll send, I'll send an email out. There'll be plenty of opportunities for questions. Um, for the people who have contacted me, I will try and make albums, folders ahead of time with your name. So you can either deposit photos on our hoops.io photos um, directory, or if you need help, I can help you do that as well. But um, I thought I'd just drop it out there since oh, I had the masses here anyway um, to just give, you know, just to, uh, in case you have any, if you're interested, reach out to me. Uh, but the, the email will go out anyway, so you'll be able to have plenty of opportunities. So I figured I'd throw that, that reminder out to you guys while I'm here. Hey, John, you know, just, yeah. on sorry, the Zoom John, fest. the would be interested in that. Um, I'm sorry? The NJRC, our club, would be interested in doing that too. We've been talking about it, and it, and uh, the Nevik was brought up that they did do this, and I didn't know all the, uh, the the nuts and bolts of it all. So would that be within this email? Uh, yeah, I, in fact, I will. I'll, I'll basically uh, what I might do is I'm just I'm just, I haven't decided whether to send just a big email or send just like a PDF attachment. Not that it's that long; it's a couple of pages. But I then I might like just put the the, the key bullets. And then yeah. if you want to read the details, read more, and there'll be opportunities for questions. But yeah, of course, we're, we're happy to, to uh, you know, um, share with you guys. And who knows, maybe you might come back with some feedback and say, hey, had you thought about doing it this way? Um, um, you know, we're certainly open to that cross-pollinization. And um, if it helps, you know, we, it, it, we, you know, we work pretty well because, the, you know, obviously it's not the same as, you know, trying to sell 100 items. You sort of pick three to five items and you know, depending on the thing, you might be able to, you know, some people might be able to try to sell six or eight. If there's time, you'll get another five minute slot. So we just try to rotate through. Um, plus we, we will have a couple of uh, contests. There'll be one for uh, radios. So we basically bring whatever you want, if you want to and uh, enter the contest. Um, and there'll be a non-radio vintage electronics. So whatever is non-radio, so it could be a reel to reel, a phonograph, 
uh, you know, rep, uh, you know, any of the, the whole list of vintage computer, you know, whatever is something interested, it's just a simple fifty dollar prize for each. Nothing, uh, nothing too fancy because of the sort of the, the way we have to run this anyway. But um, presenters can, as part of the, as part of the uh, round robin, someone can just go in and just show their item, you know, say, hey, this is what it is. And, uh, and we'll assign a number to all the entrants. So when people, all attendees vote, they'll just send me an email saying, hey, my favorite radio was number 10 and my favorite non-radio was number 20. Um, because we'll just go by the number, every, every registrant is assigned a number um, is what we'll do. And some of those details will come out. I, it may be not, it's, it's implied, but I'll, I'll be sending more details because we have, we have some time. But the, the, the basic rules on how we're going to organize it will be will be I'll be sending out probably by this weekend, and um, if anyone's interested to uh, to be a either a uh, seller, a solicitor in case you're looking for something, um, a donor because it'll be a virtual free table. You, if you have something free to give away, and there's somebody out there who wants it, here's your opportunity. And of course, you can be a contestant. And if you want to be none of the above, you can just join in and watch and just get a nice big cup of coffee and uh, sit back and, and uh, enjoy it. Um, is the history of it, the history of it is uh, people, uh, it's mostly pickup or is it going to be mail out? So how do people work it? Uh, no, any people from New Jersey who want to join must own a large vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that gentleman's speaking right there. <laughs> we've I, we've I kind of left it up to the to the folks who make a deal, so to speak, to work out their right. socially distant mode of uh, transacting the right. the drop off or the pickup. Whether that's you know meeting at a uh, undisclosed location on a state highway or whether it's shipping. You know, that's and it's and that factors in, I think, a little bit to people's decisions, you know, to buy as to where something is. So it's not really where you have to commit to shipping. We kind of let you work out that offline uh -huh. so that doesn't uh, eat into right. the time of the of the bartering. Exactly. And these things are becoming pretty popular. I mean, I had seen somebody mentioned one. M-A-A-R-C is doing some type of a virtual yes. yeah, well, swap as well as uh, I just received an email from the uh, Antique Radio Club of Illinois and they are going to be doing their first. So, you know, in light of the current circumstances, it's uh, yeah. it's yeah, not the I same have... as a swap, but it's a fun thing to do. And, you know, maybe they'll even do them when they go back to swaps. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, for the Estes. time being, it keeps us out of trouble. I understand Estes is doing them also, Paul. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things we'll do is uh, offer a couple of options here for uh, at the beginning, you'll, you know, tell where you live, you know, the town, just right off the bat so people know where, how far you are away in case there's a fire, knows, you know, how far you have to drive or something. Mm -hmm. um, and also a, a way to contact you, whether email address or phone, and typically phone it makes more sense in terms of if you want to text somebody or something. Um, one of the things that was suggested um, which I did add into the rules or the suggestion is that you can temporarily change your Zoom name to include your email address or your phone number. Just change it and just put it on there. And that way you don't even have to put a sign up. It'll be there for the entire duration of the meeting. Right, like you're in your own little antique booth. Yeah. Exactly. So that's, it was a good suggestion from, uh, from Joe. And I thought, hey, that's a good idea. So, uh, um, so we're going to, or if you want to do the old fashioned way of holding up a piece of paper that's, you know, large enough, you can do that too. That's not going to, you know, we don't really care. Um, but uh, anyway, stay tuned. I will not, I will send email out. You feel the free ask questions. Rich, I'll send you a copy uh, okay. as well. So you have way, um, you know, interesting for your feedback. And if you guys want to take run with it, that's absolutely fine. Um, we can always chat if you have any other questions or whatever. All right, John, thank you. Uh, what about dues? What don't. about your dues? As in, as in club dues? Yes. Uh, Six dollar internet memberships payable at the Nevik website. Right. Yeah. If you go yeah. to the, I just, yeah. I haven't gone to the website recently. I mean, I've, I'm a member, but I haven't. I mean, it's yearly dues, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, we're actually making um, a few little changes on the website, but I believe the section on the membership uh, you can use uh, PayPal. Oh, great! Great. Yeah. It is. And, yeah. Uh, the membership thing, I difference. think, is kind of staying the same. Obviously, we do that now, too. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Very convenient. Yeah. Our uh, webmaster, uh, Joe Coco, said that a while ago, so that way it's nice and easy on everybody. Yeah. Oh, great. I'll be hitting that soon then. All right. Excellent. Don't make us send out the collection agency. They're brutal up here. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm worse <laughs> because I am the collection agency it must be in the NJRC. <laughs> and it comes a time where I have to send out the postcards. Yeah, I hear you. I hear Asking you. people why they've left the club. <laughs> that usually gets them going. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you better have a good reason, like you expired or something or an obituary. That's, still not a, that's not a good reason. Yeah. Need better than that. <laughs> All right. All right, gentlemen, thanks again for joining us and uh, stay warm. Hopefully the snowless winter down here continues because uh, my snowblower blew out right before the 14 inch snowstorm and uh, oh, no. the long range, the long range weather. I'm just looking for an end of season sale, I think, at this point, because uh, yeah. there's just like no serious snow in the 10 day forecast and we're almost right. into February. So I know we yeah, will pay means- dearly or we might get off the hook. So. Well, you're trying you to get like to antique those. radios. I've got some antique snowblowers you might be interested in. <laughs> Contact <laughs> me offline. Yeah, I like, think that was my problem in the first place. When, when, when John says situation. you need a truck when you, you buy something, I mean, he really needs to need a 40 footer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Richard, I free understand. snowblower with every console purchase going on now. <laughs> Richard, were you trying Crazy to contact Eddie. Tom uh, for a possible talk or something? I think you, somebody said you were having trouble with my email. Yeah, and uh, thanks to Joe, I got your correct email. Okay, good. All right. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Professor Tom. Okay. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah, All right. Well, welcome aboard and don't be a stranger. Yeah. Come on down. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks for joining everybody. And okay. uh, stay tuned. Right. For the next right. week. Have a good two weeks. Joe yeah. Devastro, another log on the fire. <laughs>